Has Christianity always been one of the religions in the world to you? Oh, hallelujah. Christianity is not a religion. Neither is it a joining of a church and doing the Christian things like praying and giving and so on. Hallelujah. Christianity is the outworking of God's own kind of life received into the spirit of a man. Whoa. This divine life in the heart of a man makes him righteous, keeps him healthy, divinely guarded in life, prosperous and victorious. It gives you the ability to enjoy intimate fellowship with the Father and have dominion on this earth. Hallelujah. This is what awaits you if you will wholeheartedly believe that Jesus is the Son of God raised from the dead and personally confess him as the Lord of your life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Join Dr. David Binder on the Good Life Devotion every Monday to Friday on this channel and receive truth that will usher you into exhibiting the divine life. Kindly note that you can enjoy the Good Life Devotion on these other platforms at their stated times. Do choose the most convenient one for you or switch to another in case of a broadcast challenge with your usual platform by all means don't miss the good life devotion any day now welcome to today's episode with dr david Bindon. wow praise the lord hallelujah hallelujah it is such a joy once again to welcome you to today's special episode of our favorite good life devotion if you are new, the Good Life Devotion is a daily devotional teaching on the truth of God's word on many platforms. So we're going to come to you again on this same platform, same time tomorrow, with the Lord Taris. We'll bring you teachings that will deliver to you the nuggets of the kingdom to enjoy the good life experience. We'll bring you deeper teachings that are aimed at making you to mature, to attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, and to make you much more effective in the work of the ministry. So that together as a body of Christ on the earth, we can reach out to many more humans and bring them into God's eternal plan for their lives. This is going to be an awesome week, as I've been mentioning to you before. About a month ago, we announced for questions pertaining to the things that we've been teaching you over the years, and some other uh, maybe thoughts concerning your faith that might be bothering you, that you need some clarifications of the Spirit. And we have received a number of questions from you. By the grace of God, two weeks ago, we took a look at some of them. And this week, we are going to take a look at some others. Are you ready? Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. For a new day. Thank you, Lord. For virtues of life entering bodies, minds, and spirits. Thank you for transformation in the life and the spirit of your word. The surface of the earth is renewed. Mm. Thank you that academic burdens are lifted, financial burdens are lifted. Oh, Bali, Komandi, marital troubles are lifted. And people are at peace to focus on God's purpose for their lives. I give you praise now and forever. Hallelujah. Praise God. Wow. So we're going to start today. And uh, let's see if we can take two questions today. I remember two weeks ago I mentioned I was going to take two questions in a certain episode and we couldn't because time didn't permit us. Let's see how far we'll go today. Our first question we'll take a look at today, if we'll be able to do two, is centering around ministering to God, ministering to the Lord. And uh, that question was sent to us from Brother Jeffrey Akoko Frempon in Ghana. And here goes his question. He says, what does it mean to minister to the Lord? What does it mean to minister to the Lord? I remember far back some years ago, somebody sent us a question and he was troubled that we say we bless the Lord because in his mind, who are we to bless the Lord? You know, so if somebody says I'm ministering to the Lord, possibly somebody may wonder who are we to say we are ministering to the Lord? But of course, I'm sure Brother Jeffrey is asking from another perspective. So let's take a look at that. Uh, as part of our response, we're taking our main scripture today from Acts chapter 13, and we're going to read the second verse from the uh, King James Version, Acts 13 verse 2. In Acts 13 verse 2, the Bible says, And as they ministered unto the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul 
for the work whereunto I have called them. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Now we'll try and look at how to uh, address this response from uh, a few thoughts. Let's look firstly at the technical definition of um, minister, you know, to minister. Um, the word minister used in the Greek in the New Testament and especially also in the place that we just read um, generally means to render public service to a state or a king or do the service of a priest in the temple. So when a person renders public service to a state, he's a minister of state, okay? If somebody is rendering a public or personal service to a king, he's a minister to the king. Now, when people carry out priestly ministry, okay, of God or the service of the temple, they are said to be ministering in the house of God. So to minister means to carry out a service, to attend to a call. You know, that's the general meaning. In our context today as ministering to the Lord, it means that we are focusing on um, rendering service or ministry to God. So we're talking about ministering to the Lord. So rendering a service, attending to a call by God. So it, we are talking about ministering to God. It's not a state in this case, not a king in this case, but of course, the king of kings, the Lord our Father. Now let's now look at the definition when we come to ministering to the Lord as um, it is in Christ. So we just look at the general definition and how in our discussion we're talking about ministering to God Almighty our Father and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we're looking at, so in Christ, what does it mean? Let's take a look at um, First Peter. Thank you, Holy Ghost. You are such an amazing Father. We love you forevermore. Hallelujah. Mm. First Peter chapter 2, verse 5, in the King James says that, Ye also as lively stones, is the word living stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So in Christ, we have become a lot of things, especially four or five main ones. We have constituted a Zion, a city of God. In Christ, we constitute a priesthood in which Jesus is the high priest. In Christ, we constitute a family, a household of God in which Jesus is the firstborn. In Christ, we constitute a body in which Jesus is the head. Are you following? In Christ, we are, we are living stones that are built up a temple in which Jesus is the cornerstone. These are amazing truths about the church. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Mm. So now, coming back to the priesthood aspect. So as a priesthood, we are to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Remember, in the general definition of minister, we said you are rendering service to a state or rendering service to a king, or you are carrying out a priestly ministry in the temple of God and to God. So when we talk about ministering unto the Lord in Christ, we are talking about carrying out that service in the house of God and unto God in Christ as a, as a priest in the priesthood that the body of Christ constitutes. So this is what it means to minister um, to the Lord. Now, generally speaking about ministering to the Lord, let me explain it and break it down a little bit. To minister to the Lord then refers to all that we do in our being in Christ as avenues of worship to God. As we express our divinity towards God, towards the people of the world, 
and towards the church. So, as a child of God, um, my whole life is a worship unto my Father. And it is about my relationship with Him as a divine being born after His own kind. Now, when I express that relationship directly to God, I'm ministering to the Lord. When I express that nature indirectly to God, as I interact with other brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm ministering to the Lord. When I express that divinity indirectly as I minister to God by relating with people of the world or creation, I'm ministering to God. Are you following? So, when, I, when, when I'm interacting or when I render a service to a member of the body of Christ or members of the body of Christ, I'm not actually serving them. I'm serving the Lord. So you see the Bible tells servants. It says, don't do your work of servanthood as men pleases. But whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. And yet they were employees or servants to employers or masters. And Jesus said, if you are carrying out your work as an employee, don't do it to please the employer. Do it as unto the Lord. Why? You are a child of God. Your life is a ministry unto God. So whatever we do towards um, the world, the people of the world, or even creation, as a means of expressing God, which should be our whole life, is a ministration unto God. Listen, God created the whole creation, okay? And he created human beings. And they are yet to become sons of God. Now, when you are in link properly with God. You don't interact with nature for yourself. Your interaction with nature is based on your expression of God to nature. So at the end of the day, it is what you are doing unto God, not necessarily unto nature or unto man or unto the church. Are you following? So all these things constitute ministering unto the Lord. Now, when it comes to um, the area of communing with God as in what we call typical temporal worship or prayer, then um, ministering unto the Lord. So I, we specifically chose the Acts 13 too because that one talks about a group of sons and daughters of God who have gathered and in terms of prayer, in terms of a temporal worship, they were said to be ministering unto the Lord. So I'm now zeroing in on that, okay? We said that, but in prayer, ministering unto the Lord means loving the Lord, worshiping the Lord, and praising Him. I hope you are following the whole thing. We, we are taking it from a general perspective onto a more narrowed dimension. So generally, my whole life, which is a worship unto God, is a ministration unto the Lord. Whether I'm expressing that directly to God or to God indirectly through ministering to the body of Christ or other sons and daughters of God or indirectly to God by ministering to uh, humans or creation, I'm doing all of these unto God. So it's a ministration unto the Lord. Now, when I come to ministering directly to God, in terms of communing with him, then we are talking about in moments of worshiping him, loving him, and praising him. This is ministering unto the Lord. So when I'm in prayer or I'm in praise or whatever, oh man, and I look unto my beautiful Father, the Holy Ghost, look to my Lord Jesus and eternal Father. And I lift my hands out of my heart, whichever way, and I'm blessing the Father, worshiping Him, declaring who He is, and just loving Him. I am ministering unto the Lord. That's what it means. And let's take a look at Hebrews 13. Book of Hebrews, chapter 13. Um, we'll look at the 15th verse. Remember, in um, 1 Peter 2, 5, we are told that uh, as part of the priesthood, we should offer um, sacrifices that are acceptable to the Father by Jesus Christ. Now, let's move into details looking at that. Hebrews 13, verse um, 15, and it says that, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God. 
continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So the sacrifice that we are supposed to offer to the Lord in 1 Peter 2, he defines it. Sacrifice of praise unto God continually. And how do we do that? Using our mouths, we make mention of his name. We give thanks to his name. We confess his name. So that's a typical example. When he said, Blessed be the Lord and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Glory to God. You are blessing him. You are ministering unto him. When he said, The Lord is holy, none is like unto him. Praise the Lord. You are ministering to him. Great are you, O Lord, forever. You are ministering to him. There is none like you who work at everything after the counsel of your will. You know, on and on and on and on. The fruit of your lips. Declaring his holiness. Declaring his name. Making mention of his name. You are ministering unto the Lord. And as I've been sharing with you concerning prayer from time to time, this is the highest form of prayer. And the more you mature in God, the more your prayers will be much of ministering unto the Lord. As for ministering to people, commanding nature and all that, they'll form just a microcosm of your prayer. Those who are not mature spend more time asking God for things and battling with demons. But the more mature you are, the more these ones decrease. And the more you increase in the ministration to the Lord. Look at these apostles, mighty men of God. If you look at verse 1, prophets and teachers. And they gathered. And they were fasting, not binding demons. They were fasting, not praying for breakthroughs. They were fasting, not praying for marital trouble. They were fasting and ministering unto the Lord. Are you hearing this? I've always said that there are certain practices in the Bible that have been neglected today. And that's why a lot of the biblical results are not seen today. If these mighty men of God will gather and just minister unto the Lord, what do you think will happen if we do the same thing? Where were their problems? Where were their witches? Where were their, their troubles? They had grown in so much in Christ that everything pertaining to life and godliness was theirs. So they could focus on God. I bless you with grace to arrive at that place in the name of the Lord Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Wow, I've rushed a little bit because I want to take two questions. So I'm going to go on a share one at a time. We'll take um, a look at another question. I'll be right back after this break. This book, Daddy Holy Spirit, is a classic on how to work with the Holy Spirit. Working with the Holy Ghost is very important in being relevant in this final book. And this book is to help get the Holy Spirit taught to his place in our lives as our Father and restored to the church as the Father of the church and to be able to walk with him. And everyone must have a copy. Your life will never be the same. Wow, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Are you back? All right, let's see whether we can, within the next five or ten minutes, take a look at um, uh, this question. If you are following from the Emancipator, this question was captured on Saturday. And uh, it's a question from Benezer Jesse Aban. And um, he is asking, he says that in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, the Holy Spirit it's a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. And in 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4, according to his great mercy, he gave us a new birth to an incorruptible and undefiled and unfading inheritance. What are these inheritances? So quickly let me read, though we have just a short time, let me read through the scriptures that our brother Ebenezer was uh, quoting. Ephesians um, 1, 13 quickly it says that in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that holy spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory hallelujah the second scripture our brother quoted is first peter 
chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, it says that, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy had begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that faded not away, reserved in heaven for you. So our brother is asking, what are these inheritances? Now we want to uh, take it in one swallow. And uh, we put it as, Scripture speak of our inheritance in Christ from various perspectives. So in various ways you see the Bible talking about inheritance, inheritance, inheritance. Simply, an inheritance simply means an allotment. You know, a portion received by somebody either by reason of a relationship or a reward. So like maybe a father has um, an estate and then he, he apportions it. You take this part. You take, this is your lot, okay? So a person's lot is his inheritance. That's the technical word used there. So he has inherited, he has, he has been apportioned a portion or a part of a whole, okay? Either by reason of his relationship or as a result of a reward. That's the general meaning of an inheritance. Now, but if you look at it this way, there are a lot of things that we are entitled to um, in our father's universal estate by reason of being sons and daughters of God so that we cannot enumerate all of them at a go. And there are also things that we will be entitled to as rewards by reason of the way we have lived and maximized the Christ in us for his goal and purpose. Okay, so these are inheritances. However, we want to look at it from a bullet perspective. Comparing a person's son and a person's neighbor's son. Now, a person can enumerate certain things he's given as gifts to a neighbor's son from his house. So you can say, okay, oh, my neighbor's son, come. I want to give you uh, maybe my phone as a gift. I want to give you maybe the ironing board in the house as a gift. I want to give you maybe a car as a gift. But concerning my son, I don't enumerate that, okay, you take ironing board, you take this. Everything in the house belongs to him. By being my son, he has access to every other thing in the house. That is not the same for a neighbor's son. I'm using this human analogy for you to understand it. So if you want to look at the, inher the true inheritance of sons and daughters of God, our ultimate inheritance is what we were predestined to receive in Christ. And that is sonship. Becoming the sons of God is our ultimate inheritance. And within that, we are entitled to many other things in the kingdom. So if you read the scriptures carefully, you, you will notice. Let's go back to the same Ephesians chapter 1 that our brother quoted. And he took us to the 13th verse. But let's just go a few verses before then and go to the 11th verse. Ephesians 1, 11, it says that, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Did you see that? In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So he said that we have obtained a certain inheritance because we have been predestinated to receive it. What have we been predestinated to receive in Christ? The same Ephesians chapter 1. Go back to verse 4. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So what God predestined us to receive is to receive adoption of sons in Christ. Now verse 11 says that in whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated. So this inheritance we've obtained in Christ is what we're predestinated to. And that's the inheritance of being sons. And the Bible says that now that we are sons, we are heirs with God. My God, let me quickly read that because time is catching us up. But let me just read that before we round up. In Romans 8, I love it. In verse, um, mm, 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 verse 15 says that, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but 
ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Verse 16. The spirit himself, okay, gives this itself. The spirit himself bear a witness with our spirits that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God. And join us with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. I've been explaining this a lot of part to you in many ways. But let's focus on the first part. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God. Join heirs with Christ. So, as our brother is asking, we don't need to split S on, okay, which in heaven was the name of that inheritance. No, we are sons of God. That's our ultimate, we have inherited sonship. And as sons of God, we are now joined S with Christ over all the estate of God. And joint S is a bit different from co S. Co S means that, okay, we co own something. So, uh, maybe I own 60%, you own 40% depending on how much we contributed. But joint heirs means that we all own the thing 100%. It belongs to each of us 100%. So we are joint heirs with Christ. So everything that God has in creation as part of his estate, we, we are jointly in ownership of it with Jesus Christ. So, Brother Ebenezer and all of us, let us be excited. Our inheritance is more than things to list. Okay, I have two houses in heaven. I have a caterpillar in heaven. I have this. No, those are just microcosms of, of the whole thing. We have the whole of God's estate. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's why he said, everything pertaining to life and godliness has been given to you. You are a big deal. Praise God. Well, our time has caught us up. Let's pray. Let's bless the Lord for bringing us into such a place of abundance. Thank you, Lord. He brought us to this large area in life. If you've been watching us, what are you looking for in life? Did you know that when God made you as a human, his aim was not that you remain a human forever. You were chosen before the foundation of the world to be adopted as a son of God in Christ Jesus. If that hasn't happened, no matter all you may be doing on this earth, life hasn't begun for you. You will end up as an unfinished product. But God doesn't want that to happen in your life. That's why he sent us your way. Jesus Christ, the son of God, he came into this world and died to take mankind out of the consciousness of sin and bring us into the experience of sonship. This is all we just spoke about. You can become a son of God today and step into God's eternal kingdom forever. How does that happen? Believe Jesus came and died and rose again and his death and resurrection made available the life of God which you can receive into your spiritual and body and become born of God. If you want this to happen in your life, can say this after me with all your heart. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I'm glad you came to die for the sin of mankind. I'm glad you rose from the dead. I'm glad you are Lord today. Jesus, you are declared Lord of my life. I receive eternal life. I am born again. Hallelujah. So that is all your heart. Truly, you are born again. Make sure you contact us and we'll help you to grow in Christ. I'll surely come you again in the next episode as you take a look at the next question. Till so then, life is good. Enjoy. Thank you for joining today's episode of your favorite Good Life Devotion with Dr. David Bindan. The Good Life Devotion is proudly brought to you by friends and partners of the Final Global Movement. For more information on how to become a partner, call us on 053-444-6907. Or log on to our website, finalglobalmovement.org. Become a partner today and contribute to the global spread of God's message for the now. Follow us on our various social media handles and you will be blessed. Don't miss the Good Life devotion on the channels displayed on your screen at the scheduled times. Till we come your way with the next episode of the Good Life devotion with Dr. David Bendon. Life is good. Enjoy.